In a moment, we're going to be studying the account of the conversion of the Ethiopian nobleman. But before we do that, I want us to look at the man that God chose to take the gospel to him. And the first time we come across this man who is called Philip is in Acts chapter 6. The problem that had developed there was a neglected distribution of food among the widows of the Jews who were called Grecian widows or Hellenists, that is, they were Jews born outside of Judea and Galilee. And so they're going to take care of that problem, which is not in our purview right now, except to look at Philip. Philip's name is even Greek. And you'll see the caliber of the man when you look in verse 3, because there's the qualifications the men who were going to take care of this business had to meet in order to be chosen by the people. They had to have an honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. We can see the dedication of the man even in the description and the willingness to serve in view of what he was going to be a part of with the other six men in serving there in the church. Then we come on over to Acts chapter 8 and following the apostle Paul at that time, Saul the unbeliever, you will see that uh, there was great persecution. Verse 3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And immediately then in verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now if we would describe what he did in Samaria in modern day parlance, he was having a great gospel meeting. When you read about what went on there, then many people heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. But then when we come over to the latter part of chapter 8, it's where we find the account of the conversion of the Ethiopian nobleman. Now, it's interesting that you had such a great work going on that was yielding such fruit in the form of many people obeying the gospel. And yet the preacher God chooses that is doing all of this great work is pulled away from it and sent to talk to one man. That should teach us that sometimes... Things don't go as the way men please them. Well, it's such a great thing going on here. How can we leave it alone? But Philip followed the direction of the Lord. Now we recognize the miraculous element in all of this. But at the same time, these were people doing what people do and doing what the Lord said and teaching others and in responding to the truth. We see that it's by direction of the Lord through an angel that Philip was told to rise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. We hear of this today as the Gaza Strip, that area. It's old uh, Philistia, where the Philistines lived. So he's going down there. Now, notice he's told to go, but in verse 26... There's not a thing in the world said by God, now you're going to find this man there and he's going to be thus and so and he's going to be doing this. He doesn't know that. He just knows that the Lord said go and go to this certain place. And notice the response in verse 27. There was no hesitancy. And he arose and went. And that's always good to see in brethren. The will of the Lord, what is it? We know it. We rise up to do it. You find that same type of description when it comes to the command of Father Abraham to take his son, his only son, the son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering to me. Early the next morning, he got up and started off on the trip. As I've said many times jokingly, the way we are, I think I'd been a good morning to sleep late. But no, it was the will of the Lord. It's time to do it. When is that time? As soon as I understand what God wants me to do. So he arose and went. 
And he gets down there, and then Luke records, he beholds a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. And everybody knows a man of this caliber and of that status would not have much interest in the gospel of Christ. If anything, he'd probably respond like the folks in Jerusalem did when they responded to Stephen, who would be fresh on the mind of everybody at this stage as far as the church is concerned. But that's not the view of things. Of course, God knows the hearts of all men. And we find that this man is a devoted person. He has traveled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles to do what he believed God wanted him to do. And now he's been to Jerusalem to worship, as the law commanded. Verse 28, he's returning. Well, he's not like a lot of folks. Well, I've had enough of that. I don't need to think about that for the next time I come up here. The man of all things is in that chariot. Now think about that. And he's still studying. That's rather an amazing thing. And returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Now, that's the description of this man. Does mean Philip knew all about him at the point that Luke tells us about him. But when verse 29 comes along, how does Philip know to deal with this man? He knows he's down there for a reason. He knows he's obeying God. He's gone to the right place. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. Now, this is not just somebody walking down the road. This is a man of high authority, of importance. Likely, he had a number of people with him. Ordinary folks just don't approach him. But that's what God said, and Philip just didn't know any better than do what he was told and the way he was told to do it and for the reason he was told to do it. So in verse 30, you find how it was. Philip does what he did when he first got the commandment of God. He ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet. He got close enough to hear him reading. Man's reading out loud, isn't he? Don't notice that sometimes too much. Throw this pointer out to you. Sometimes we had learned to read out loud. You'd be surprised how the scriptures, just by noticing the commas and the periods and the semicolons and the colons and all of that, reading it accordingly, reading it out loud, sometimes things just come together for you. But they weren't coming together for him, but that's what he's doing. I know that because Philip heard him. And he said, um, you understand what you're reading? Now, notice in this case, the preacher asked the question. Why would he ask that question to Isaiah? About Isaiah, that is, where he's reading it. Why would he ask it? Because there is not anybody anywhere without the knowledge of the gospel in the New Testament that understands Isaiah 53. Not a soul. You can't. Because you don't have the wherewithal to understand it. Now that was what we have, and then we don't have that today as far as people who study the Bible because we've got the whole Bible. And they read, as we do, the whole of the Old Testament with so much knowledge of the new to help us. He had that, did not have that knowledge, wasn't there to have. So we find that. The question was, do you understand what you're reading? That also tells me that we as people of the church desirous of trying to deal with other people who need salvation, that we should think about questions we ask them. How we get involved in a congregation. How we get involved with people outside the congregation. Why can you ask somebody, whether a brother or sister, or especially one you would like to see converted, to get their attention? Well, I notice this man is already devoted. He's already a sacrificial person. He's already recognizing the authority of God. He's already demonstrated by the fruit borne out in his life 
that he loves God. And so, do you really understand? And of course, verse 31 says, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. This tells me so much about this high and mighty treasure of the queen of Ethiopia. He's not a proud man. If you can help me on this, if you have the wherewithal to help me understand this, why well, come right up and help me. I'll be glad to hear from you. I don't know you. But it's obvious you have an interest in what I'm studying. And if you can help me understand, I'll be glad to have you get up here and study the Bible with me. Now, question. Do we present that disposition of heart and attitude toward all those we're around about? So, he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And we see now where he's reading, the place of the Scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. Now, you see the point that the man has in his mind that he's trying to figure out. He answered, Philip said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? First of all, he acknowledges that Isaiah is a prophet. He knows this is scripture. He knows this is the word of God. So you've got that to work with with this man. The man is a dedicated man. Sometimes we won't see that as you read through the book of Acts and the people that have the scriptures taught to them. But in this case, it's like the people on the day of Pentecost. They believe in God. They believe in the Old Testament. They believe in obeying. They're devout. They're determined to do God's will as they understand it. So he says, is he talking about himself or some other man? And here is where so many times members of the Lord's church aren't prepared. And it's in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. Now I want to drive a little peg down right here and spend a little time on that concerning the importance of your individual Bible study and your attendance at Bible study and exposing your mind to the truth of God's word. There is simply no substitute for private study of the will of God. Your creator and he who guides you through life and can only do it by your dedication to his word and the right division of it. Even to a young evangelist, Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, God knew the heart of this man. God knew his dedication. He knew his steadfastness. And he knew exactly where he was in his studies. And he's dealing with a passage that focuses right in on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now what is amazing is that God could get these two people together right at this point. Here Philip is in a great gospel meeting in Samaria. He says, leave. When I think of their modes of transportation. He knows exactly how, as Philip had to travel to get him down there, right at the right place where he intersects with Ethiopian nobleman. Now, let that sink in. Let that sink in who's in control of things providentially. And while this is revealed to us, providentially, God works the same today. If not, tell me how he answers any prayer you ever pray. Because he's not going to do it by a miracle. So God knows how to do these things. Aren't you glad you don't have to figure it out? But it does tell us if you've got a dedicated preacher of the gospel that's a faithful Christian like Philip, and you've got a man who's outside of Christ but devoted to doing what's right to the best of his ability, God can get them together even when neither one of them is knowing what's about to happen. All Philip knew, remember, was this is where God told me to go. 
when we have our once a month door knocking, do we pray all of the time that God will get us together with someone like the Ethiopian nobleman? And if he does, are we able to begin at the same scripture or begin at wherever they are and preach to them Jesus? See, there's a lot more involved in this than getting one man converted to Christ. And that's important. That's why Luke recorded it. But it's a lesson to you and to me as members of the church. Should we not have the same zeal and desire that Philip had and proved his worth to the church? Notice he began as a servant of tables. But he was willing to do it because it was the thing to do and satisfy the problem there in the church at Jerusalem. Are we willing to do that when it's necessary, whatever it may be, and how lowly and menial a task it may be? Or as the old saying goes, is it like pulling teeth to get us involved in what we will confess is a good work and ought to be done? So God can use Philip because Philip is ready to be used. Well, what about the Ethiopian eunuch? Well, because of his disposition to stay with what he's got, he fits well, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seeking shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now, the verbs in the Greek there, present tense verbs, it doesn't mean, well, I've knocked, you're not home, I'm leaving. It's the continual knocking to receive what you want from God. It's not doing it one time and saying, that's it. You persist, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's just tenaciousness. It's a form of being dogmatic, and I know this is God's will, and I know it's right. I can read it. I've understood it. I've applied it to my life. I'm not going to quit doing it. Yeah, but this is this, and this is that. Everything's not going like you think it ought to. Then you ask yourself, well, is it God's will? Yes. Then you keep doing it. You keep on knocking. You keep on asking. You keep on seeking. Now, I wonder, when we read this about this nobleman, how often had he spent in prayer? How often had he given his time to the pondering of the Scriptures as he read them? You can see something about the man. He's not just reading and getting information. He's thinking, I want to know who this is. I want to understand this. So, he preaches unto him Jesus. What is it to preach to a person Jesus? What does that mean? If you look back earlier at Philip and his work, there in uh, Samaria, you'll see that Luke records by inspiration, verses 11 and 12 of chapter 8, but when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. What do you think he preached something different there and then got over here with the Ethiopian eunuch and because it says he preached Jesus, he preached something different. Those are all just different ways of saying he preached the gospel to the man. That's exactly what he did. And you'll notice when he preached there in Samaria that he preached things concerning the kingdom of God. And the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ. Why does it say the name of Jesus Christ? Because he's talking about the authority of Jesus Christ. That's why you have in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 the reading that you do. The Jews there were devoted to doing what God said to them through Moses. They had no problem believing in God. Where was the problem? Look at the sermon that's recorded that Peter preached. 
and he zeroes in on proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. And he lays at their feet his death. That is their responsibility in it. Ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. When they understood the evidence, adequate and credible that it was, showing that the apostles were speaking things from heaven and not from men, had the stamp of God's approval on it by the miracles, signs, and wonders that they did, showing the proper use of Scripture in the preaching of Peter and the other apostles, they were pricked in their heart and cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's by the authority of Christ. If you do something in somebody's name, you do it by his authority. If you don't believe it, go out here and do something in the name of Texas when you don't have the authority to do it in the name of Texas and see what you get into. Or, if you want to make yourself really understand it, then have somebody do something in your name when you didn't give them the right to do it in your name. So to do something in the name is to do it by the authority. And we're back to what you're reading above my head all the time. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to God the Father by Him. So... What he's saying is, when he preaches unto him Jesus, he's preaching the Messiah. He's preaching the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching all things that pertain to proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the one being talked about by the prophet Isaiah who wrote those words in Isaiah 53 over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. When people say, well, he preached Jesus. Do they actually think he just said Jesus, Jesus, Jesus over and over again and that's all he ever said to the man? Well, that's the height and breadth of absurdity. We'll just add the depth of absurdity too to cover it all. So what we have is just a way the scriptures tell us that something took place. It helps us understand how God communicates with us and that's what the whole purpose of the Bible is, to instruct us in righteousness. So to preach Jesus is to preach the gospel. To preach all that's necessary to bring one to Christ. Now there must have been something in there about baptism. You read verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Preach Jesus. All of a sudden man's going to be baptized. And they're in a desert place. And you come up to a body of water. And it must be deep enough to bury somebody because I find out baptism is a burial. Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Colossians 2, 12. So Philip says, well, okay, do you believe with all thine heart, your emotions, your intellect, your conscience, your will, all your inward man? If you believe, you, you can and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both in, down both into the water, and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now because I read Romans 6, 3, and 4, that baptism is a burial, as well as Colossians 2, 12, I now know why they stopped the chariot and both of them went down in the water. I can't determine that just from this passage alone. But now I understand why they did. Because I find elsewhere when we're discussing baptism that baptism is a burial. I know also from the Greek word baptizo that it's to plunge or to immerse or to dip. That's the reason they did it. I know also it's the preacher, in this case, baptizing the person who needed it. Baptism is a passive thing. Have you ever noticed that? It's done by the authority of Christ, Acts 2.38. And we're being baptized into a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Matthew 28.18, verses following. But it's by the authority of Christ. So this is what was done. So in reality, you're obeying Christ. Christ is baptizing you 
He just does it through whoever it is that puts you under the water. You are being obedient to Christ, aren't you, when you're baptized? If when you were baptized in your mind you were not being obedient to Christ, then who you were obeying? And so Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, very plainly, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now we're going to understand why you have in verse 39, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Why would he rejoice? He's a new creature in Christ. His old sins are washed away. He's a member of the church. How do I know that? Because the Lord ever adds everybody that does this to his church, to others who believed and done likewise. His sins are remitted. Now he goes on his way. Would to God that all those outside of Christ that could be in this, that are in this assembly this morning, would leave this building rejoicing today, knowing their sins are forgiven. Because you can do it in the exact same way this man did. But it'll take belief of the gospel of Christ. It'll take those of us who are in the church to understand how to approach people. To take advantage of asking questions. Or when they ask us questions. Now I want to say one reason I chose to do this this morning. Yesterday, Brother Ralph called me and gave me a little report about a visit at door knocking. They had Charles... Nero and him had about a question that was put to them that was rather interesting. And I'm not going to go into the whole detail, but I, I intend to deal with more this afternoon as far as another illustration. But he emphasized to me, are we ready to deal with questions? So many times we get on the defensive. Now, I will tell you this much. If the man did say, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, I'll listen to you if you'll listen to my speech on politics. Well, now, here, here's the bad part about that. When we in the church hear politics, we start figuring out not to say things. Well, it never hurts to be cautious. We're I mean, to be circumspect. We're to be careful. That's not the point. The point is we ought to be able to find a spot where to preach Jesus. Now somebody says, well, maybe so, on morals and so forth. Let me give you a point that I don't think we think about much at all. There's not any topic that comes up that does not involve, involve a moral question. I want you to think about it. There's not any topic that comes up that does not involve some kind of moral question. Not any. Economics. Oh, there's a lot involved there. The Lord saw to that. How many times did the Lord use uh, economics to teach spiritual lessons? The truth of the matter is, life is about morality. So if anybody begins to bring anything, I don't know politics or anything else, it makes me no difference. They've just given you a pulpit. They've just given you a lectern. They've just given you, they've thrown the door wide open. Now, they may slam it when you start answering it. you got records of that in Acts 2. One time in England, I walked up to a door and knocked on the door. Heard the fellow come through the house, and he was doing this. I heard him call. Got closer, got to the door, he opened the door, and I gave him a little spiel. We're from, and whatever it was, and what we're doing, and we're here handing out literature and uh, so on. And he stood there very quietly looking at me. And when I got through with my little spiel, he says, you're through. Slammed the door. I heard him going back to the house. Well, you got to be prepared for that. But I still got my spiel. He can't say on the day of judgment that, you, that I never had the opportunity. But he did. So are we even not taking advantage of opportunities? Don't go on the defensive. Be able to answer questions. Be able to ask questions. Folks, anybody that asks you a question is saying, I'm ready to answer your questions. 
That's just an automatic implication. So it makes me no difference whether it's politics, sociology, all of the other whatever people might bring up. You can find a place to talk about the Lord. And we above all people, above all people, for we are his people and a very few of us faithful in this whole wide immoral world ought to be able to deal with somebody, even a high government official and especially <laughs> high government officials. This man was one of them. So we need to take people where we find them. We need to know the right questions to ask them. And we need to be prepared when they ask us questions to know how to direct it right back so that we can get to the point of preaching Jesus to them. You see, preaching Jesus, you may have to start way back here like you had to begin here in Isaiah. Or it may be if the person doesn't believe the Bible, you may have to start further back than that. But we're headed to one place. Teaching that man the gospel of Jesus Christ or that woman as the case may be. This is the point I wanted to make here. Why do you think Luke recorded this? It is about the church spreading. It is about the Jewish church gradually understanding, because that's going to happen in chapter 10, after the apostle to the Gentiles, Saul is converted, getting ready for the Gentiles to be accepted by the Jews. Sometimes we don't see this, but there's a lot involved here. It's not just a book about conversions. It's about the early church learning that the gospel is for all and breaking down that old middle wall of partition that the law had held up for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years between Jews and Gentiles. You can see that pop up all through the letters of Paul. Paul even uh, shows that's one reason for the collection of the saints, poor saints in Jerusalem, Jewish church. He says, I'm taking an occasion to show your love as Gentile brethren to bind you two together because you're all one in Christ. We don't see that sometimes. Well, that's what he was doing. So we don't need to miss these opportunities. And when we have brethren who could be here door, knocking on doors with us once a month, that's a big, you know, a little while on Saturday morning, that's a big sacrifice you've got to make. I mean, it really takes away from you. And if I'm shaming you some, so be it. You need to be shamed. You could be here and you could help. But you have chose something more important to you. Oh, no, no, I don't say that, preacher. But you did. You made a conscious decision. Don't tell me you didn't make a conscious decision. You made a conscious decision not to do it. There are people at times in the worship assemblies. They're not here. Well, some are sick. That's understandable. Nobody ever. It's always amazing. You have to explain that. Do we really expect somebody sick to come to services? Uh, if I find out you're here as a preacher and you're contagious, I hope we can run you out. I don't want your junk. I want you to go to the doctor. We're not talking about that and everybody with good sense knows it. We're talking about people who make conscious decisions not to do what God told them to do when in the assembly. They just won't come. Other things are more important. They can be other places. I know it because I, I know they're there. I see. Nothing else. I see what the post on Facebook. But they make a conscious decision not to be in the worship assembly of the saints. Figure that out. You see what you miss when you're not ready to do God's will every time he says it? What if Philip had been like a lot of members of the church when he said, go down there to Gaza? Oh, no, no. And I'm doing good work here. Well, that's the way we reason. And you say, well, if I was Philip, I'd done just what Philip did. No, you do what you do now. That's what you would have done. You would do just what you do now. Because the Bible has already spoken. God's will is here for your life. And you say no. So what do we do about this? Just say, well, here it tells about a man becoming a Christian. Well, yes, that's there. We don't want to miss that. But somebody who was a Christian had to be willing to do God's will so this person could become a Christian. Because God's placed the gospel in the church. As the song goes, into our hands the gospel is given. It's to be preached to everybody by us. 
those of us you see who heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. We're to teach it to others. If you're not a child of God today, we've studied what to do to become one. If you're a member of the church and you've found other things more important than the work of the church, then we hope you'll see the need to repent of such things and be active in the church as you know you ought to be. If you need to obey the gospel, do it now. If you need to repent of sins, confess them and pray God for forgiveness, please do that now and do so then while we stand and sing.